graphics development because it's so the focus of this is more or less not really just how to use F trace in general. I've given several talks on that, but this one is more specific towards uh, people who are starting out to being a kernel developer, wants to modify their code, and wants to have a way to see what's actually happening underneath the hood. So that's kind of where the focus is of this. So first, let's start off with what is F trace. Well, F trace is quote unquote the official tracer of the Linux kernel. Um, it was um, it entered the Linux kernel in 2008. Um, officially, ftrace is the way that you can hook to any function within the kernel. So all the functions within the kernel, you can actually attach to it um, and be able to do something with that function. So the infrastructure to hook to kernels within the um, or functions in the kernel is actually what ftrace technically is. Uh, but that's one of the major major features is called the function tracer, where you could trace all functions happening inside the kernel. And that is actually how come the rest of the infrastructure has become underneath the name of ftrace. So it's kind of expanded to everything that's in the sys kernel tracing directory. Uh, you'll see all these files in there. Uh, originally, it was in the sys kernel debug tracing directory, but that because it required debugfs to be compiled in and, and a lot there was a lot of requests to say, hey, we want the tracing infrastructure on our production machine, but we don't want to bring debugfs because debugfs has a lot of debug files there that could uh, make it harder to lock down the system. Uh, because debugfs may not be so secure, could have vulnerabilities as it's more or less just for debugging. So we created tracefs to allow you to install the tracing facility without um, including the, all the stuff that comes with uh, debugfs. And now if you know, if you have that compiled in, you'll see in syskernel, there'll be a tracing directory and that way you can mount to it. So what is in this uh, tracefs directory? So if you mount it, there's a command line that shows you how to mount it. And feel free to follow along on your laptop and whatnot. Ideally, you might want to do this on a VM and not your laptop, because if there's a bug in here somewhere, you could possibly lock up your machine and uh, be kicked out of this uh, talk. But anyway. Um, the commands I use are as root, they're not sudo. So, I mean, you could do sudo, but you'll be doing a lot of sudo commands. And ideally you just do a sudo su and switch in and then do everything as a root user. So after you mount tracefs, you know, you CD into that directory. So most of the commands will already have CD'd into the directory to see what that, and you'll see there's a lot of files and that could be quite overwhelming and not knowing what they all do. But ideally there's really only a few files in there that you really need to care about. There's other things in there that's more for the real advanced user, but there's a uh, much uh, subset that you'll probably ever deal with on a daily basis. In fact, we're only going to talk about a few subset of these. And yes, uh, if you notice right in the middle, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not in here, but you'll see a readme file within the tracefs directory. And yes, it does actually have a readme. It doesn't explain everything. So what is exactly what can be traced? Well, first there's this thing called events. Now, what are events? Events are static points within the kernel that allow you to extract specific data that the developer wants. So they could also be dynamic where you could actually say, hey, I want to event in something specific and I will uh, go, I will attach something here and I want some data from there. So I'll talk about that a little later. On the other side, there's also tracers. Now tracers is another, um, uh, I guess, another way of tracing things within the kernel. And tracers, as opposed to events, do functionality. Like the function tracer will trace all functions. You enable the function tracer and all functions will be tracing. Well, all functions that are called will actually be traced. You can filter it. Uh, there's ways to modify tracers. Um, function graph tracer, latency tracers will add functionality to say, okay, I wanna see how long it takes to for a process to wake up, how long interrupts are off, how long preemptions off. And that's ideally what tracers are. So going back to what are events? Well, events are broken up into uh, groups. For example, there's scheduler events, interrupt events, and they're all grouped together in these block events. There's actually probably now close to a hundred different groups of events. Um, so, each of these events are created by a developer who has wants some information shared that they think is important to debug their system. Or out on the real world, there's something happening and something's not working quite right. They can enable these events and it will show, it will extract data into a ring buffer that could be extracted from user space that people could say, hey, I I want like I'm having a problem with my block or my device driver. I have a few events in there. Enable those events. You could see them, you can modify them. 
So how do you enable these events? Well, it's actually quite simple. Um, if you know bash commands, you know, uh, echo, cat, that's basically all you need to know to work with pretty much the entire TraceFS file system. There's no utilities you need to have on top of it, although we have utilities on top of it. But ideally, if you're in the embedded world or embedded space and you just have like a busy box utility, you can actually have almost full functionality of ftrace uh, on your kernel with just a busy box interface. So if you go to that sys kernel tracing directory, and for here, I'm interested in the scheduling uh, events. So specifically sched switch, when one tax task schedules out and another task schedules in, since only one task can run on a CPU at a time, and I want to see all these events, I could just echo one into the enable file of that sched switch event. And you can see that the sched switch event is within the sched group. So, so the way the events, uh, the events are structured is you have the events directory and within them, and within the events directory, you have uh, each group will have its own directory. And within that, that directory, each event will have its own directory that has the functionality of how to enable, disable, modify, filter those events. Now, if I zoom in to this specific one, you'll see uh, what the event structure looks at. I can see that uh, the previous process that's being uh, swapped out is the SSH process. Uh, I see its, pr uh, its process ID, the prio, the priority. Now, note that the priority may look like 120 and say, hey, that's a really high priority. Inside the kernel, priorities are reversed order. So that means the lower the number of a priority inside the kernel, the higher priority it is. There's a reason for that. I'm not going to discuss that right now. But 120 means it's just really just a normal process. If you see a priority of, say, uh, five or one, those are really, really high priority processes. Uh, and the previous state is S, which means the process is going to sleep. So it basically, it said, okay, I'm going to yield the CPU and I'm going to let something else run. And the next process is the swapper task. That swapper task is just simply idle. But that's just showing you information of what you can extract from the events. So if I want to see what that format of the event is, so I want to see what is recorded. So if I go down and look into that sketch switch directory and see the format file, because every single event has a format file that allows user space code to read the raw binary. Uh, you can extract the raw binary from the uh, tracing data. So the events are written very, very fast. It's copied right in. I'll describe that later. And then it's extracted. And you could, if you want to see how to parse that, the format file directory shows you how that's done. And here, you see the sketch switch format, which you see what's saved. Everything starts off with those common type, common flags, common you know, preempt. All the common uh, fields that you see there are for all events. But then there's a space, so a new line, and then there's a the fields that are specific for each event. And that's the data that, like I said, that developer says, I think is important, and I want to see that information. And below that, you'll see how to parse that information. I'll describe that a little bit later as well. So if you look at that, the event. So the sketch switch event showed me up here on top is what was um, displayed in my, my cat the trace file. Uh, you'll see that the previous com is here. You'll see that there's the field for where it was recorded into the trace buffer. And below, you see how it was printed. And the same thing for the previous PID, the previous prio, and the state. Well, here the state looks pretty complex if you look at what was recorded. And I'll discuss that in a little bit. So how is, does a trace event look like if you look in the kernel? So if you actually have the source code for the Linux kernel and you go into the kernel sched core.c file and inside the scheduler function, you'll see down there, you'll see something that says trace underscore sched underscore switch. All trace events uh, are built on top of trace points. They're kind of very tightly coupled. And a trace point is a function that looks like, it looks like a function that you'll see trace underscore so the event name. And when you see that here, you'll see trace underscore sched switch looks like a normal function that uh, calls preempt previous next. Well, what's so special about the tracing is actually that is not a real normal function. It's actually created by a macro that does a lot of work to make sure that, you know, when that event is not actually enabled, it's really a no op. So inside the real, when you process it, when you start up your kernel, you have all these events, you'll have thousands of events within your kernel, but they don't take up much, uh, they're, they're not much overhead in them because all the locations are actually no ops. And there's magic code, I could give another talk on how that works, uh, on how to convert that no op when you enable the event, it turns into that, basically that sketch switch uh, function call. And I'll show you how to create this. 
uh, sketch switch function call. So if you want to create your own events within your own driver or anything that you're working on, or you want to add some events to the kernel, this is how you go about doing it. It's all with this um, big trace event macro. Uh, if you go into tr uh, include trace events sketch.h within the Linux kernel, you'll see that there's the sketch switch um, event is created by this macro that's shown right here. Um, you start off with the trace event, and it has several different fields. Uh, the first one is the name of the event, which will be sketch switch. And if you once you create that, you'll see that's the function that's going to be a trace underscore sketch switch. So that's where that sketch switch comes from. Also, you'll see the parameters. So the TP proto defines the proto the prototype of this function or this trace point that's going to be injected inside the kernel where you're going to place it. Uh, you need to have a TP, TP protos and TP args. They're basically going to match. They have to uh, the preempt has to match preempt names have to match because the reason why is. This is how the macro knows how to use those arguments or how to call the function with those arguments as opposed to declaring, a, uh, declaring it. So that's required because of the implementation of the trace event macro. Now, let's see, whoops. Ah, so let me go back. If you look, remember if I look back at that format file and inside the format file, I saw all these fields. Well, these fields are defined by this trace struct entry file. So you'll see that all the fields, the previous com and everything down is defined here. Uh, you'll see there's an array that defines an array. That's where you'll see the bracket 16 for previous com. It's because it's an array of task com length, which if you look at the kernel and you look at it, it's defined as 16. So uh, most Mac or pretty much all the macros within uh, that's used in the trace event macro or trace event macro will be turned to their raw numbers when you look at them from the trace, the format file for user space, because the user space doesn't know what uh, task com length is. It needs to know that it's 16 uh, to do the pro parsing properly. Um, so inside the, um, so what happens is that macro actually turns into a structure that's going to be used a with a special name called underscore underscore entry that you'll see down here. So th this is actually would turn into something that would look like this. And that's for the next part of the trace event macro, which is the TP fast assign. Well, the fast assign, this is what you could think of as how the data gets written into the ring buffer. So you pass in the prototype and you'll see here's the entry macro or that structure. So the entry is actually a structure that's uh, mapped right on top of the ring buffer. So there's no, there's not any copy of this. What happens is you allocate space on the ring buffer uh, just enough to put the uh, entry uh, structure on top of it. And then you fill in the ring buffer via this entry macro or the, the entry variable. And if you look at the test, the uh, trace sketch switch, it passes you the preempt previous next, remember they pass that in. And what that does is tells is that's the information that's going to be used to fill in the entry structure, as you can see below there. So in actuality, if you really were to look, uh, if you were to uh, let it compile or the preprocessor to go and uh, finish handling the trace event macro, ideally you'd see something that would look like this, that this function, when it's enabled, will be just called as if you just wrote the function just like that. And this is where the TP proto defines uh, what the prototype that will, you'll be using. So the last part is the TP print K, which is basically how to print this um, event after you have all the data. This is used in two cases. One, uh, this actually will be used by the trace. When you cat to trace file, it uses the TP print K um, part of the macro to know how to format and print that to user space. So it reads the raw data and exports it. Reason why we show it in the print for uh, the, the print form or the format file, uh, we that is so that uh, user space tools could read the raw data and know how to print it as well. So they try to do it identical from what happens inside the kernel to what happens in user space. And if I look at the print format file, remember how that was really, really scary and ugly? Uh, this, it doesn't look like it really matches what you had there, but believe it or not, that TP print K is what created that print format below. And if you look at that task report max right there, remember I said earlier that all macros are expanded to what they're really defined as. And if you looked into you know, the task struct um, or sked.h, uh, header file, you'll see that task report max is defined as that, uh, as a, or a bunch of other macros that finally turn into what you see below that 0, 1, 2, 4, 8, 10, uh, 10 20, 40, and then plus one shifted to the left. Uh, 
you'll see that three more times because there's three other places that that's used. Uh, we also have a bunch of helper functions that are in the underscore underscore print flags portion uh, that lets you be able to print the flags to convert um, a bit mask into uh, text. So basically, uh, if like I said, task interruptible is set, it will uh, S will show up. That way, the user doesn't have to know memorize what task interruptible bit is. You can actually turn bits into uh, text that is human readable. So this could be all well overwhelming. And you could say, well, how am I going to remember all this? I'm going to have to constantly keep looking at this video over and over again until it you know, gets into my mind. No, you do not need to memorize this. Uh, there's samples of all the functionality that can happen in trace events. If you go into the Linux kernel source code, there's a samples directory. There's a trace events directory within that that uh, discuss all this information here. Uh, Make sure you look at the make file as well that's in that directory because the make file has some information on how to make this work. Uh, it's pretty easy. I mean, the fact that well, after I created this, we have over a thousand um, or probably a couple thousand, I guess, trace events within the Linux kernel shows that it wasn't very difficult for people to implement because I didn't help these people create a few people I helped, but a lot of people just went off and read the sample files, just cut and paste. It's There's a um, template there that you could use to be able to figure this out. Just follow the directions and you should be able to have events within your code in no time. Um, the trace event macros, the template for that, and also description of the print flags and all other sorts of uh, things you can do. You got dynamic strings, you can have bit masks, you can have um, CPU masks and all that. Uh, that's all described in the trace event samples.h file. And if you want to see how it's used, um, like I said, the, the, where they're executed, it's in a trace events sample file, and it tells you how to incorporate all that there. So if you read the, all those three files, uh, you'll be able to make trace events about, or you, you will have your own trace events in your own code. Now, let's look at the other side and talk a little bit more about tracers. Believe it or not, tracers were actually inside the Linux kernel before the events were, um, because everything was done by uh, the tracers were saying, hey, I want to trace something, and you wrote uh, functionality on how to trace something. The first one was the function tracer, which is why ftrace became the name, because ftrace stood for basically the function tracer. And since that was basically the first real tracer to be added to the kernel, uh, the name stuck and all the infrastructure that came behind after it, uh, we just call ftrace as more of a general of everything that's, that's attached to that. But really, um, the function tracer was one of them. And there's also latency tracers that defines uh, functionality. So events just enable and disable a single location to get some data from, where actually tracers will actually do some work, will actually change how the kernel is running to do something. Um, what's nice is events could be enabled within the, the tracers. So you can enable events to, and those events will actually be intermingled with the tracing data. So you can see, see how, uh, if you're some specific, specific data within the, uh, the tracer that you want to see and there's an event there for it, you can enable it and it will fit right in. Some of them have, some of the tracers have their own options. So you can actually modify how the tracer works. Uh, so that'll be a little bit. So here's a basic example of how, what a tracer is. So if I again go into the tracing directory and I echo function to current tracer, current tracer is what, how you enable a tracer. By default, it's a no-op. So there's always a tracer enabled. The no-op tracer is the tracer that's enabled by default when you boot up the kernel. And if you want to disable tracing or the tracer, you just echo no-op into uh, the current tracer and that will turn off the tracer uh, because the no-op tracer does nothing as the name suggests, N-O-P. Uh, so if I were to, so if I look at here, this is the function tracer, which basically traces all functions and it shows you the parent. So when you enable the function tracer by default, uh, you'll see all the functions here. You'll see it trace the spin lock, raw spin lock function and who called it the scheduler function called the raw uh, the spin lock function. You could filter on these. There's a way to filter all this, but that's out of scope for this specific talk. I have other talks and there's a documentation to read that you can find out how to uh, modify tracers. But right now I'm just showing you that they exist. And again, as I mentioned, you can have events. So here I echoed one to events enabled within the function tracer, and you'll see all the events that appear intermingled within the tracing. Uh, again, for tracing options, the IRQs off tracer will tr uh, trace, it will, um, 
it'll record the time, all the times from when a interrupts are disabled to when they're enabled. And then it will, it will show you when it has, hits a max time. That, so the longest time that between um, disabling and enabling, it will record that into a snapshot um, ring buffer. Uh, it'll actually then, when you cat trace, you'll see uh, just a snapshot of what the longest time is. And uh, by default, it enables function, uh, the function tracer as well. So you can see all the functions that happened when the, in that time frame in the interrupts. And if you look at there, it's like it was a latency here. If you look up on top, you'll see it as a 914 microsecond latency. There was 85 events, and that's why I don't have them all here within that. But say, but function tracing does have overhead. So maybe it really wasn't 914 microseconds, and I, I, I want to turn that off. And by the way, if you're trying to see if you have IRQs off in your kernel, you probably don't because IRQs off tracer requires uh, some hooks in the kernel that needs to be there all the time. Some functions have to be called, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, some functions have to be called uh, whether the tracer is on or off. So it adds a slight overhead. So most um, uh, distribution will not enable the IRQs off, preempt off tracers, but you might have the wake up latency tracer. The wake up tracers don't add, it uses events. It actually hooks into events to do all its tracing. So it's usually, it's okay to have enabled. It won't cause any overhead by having it. But IRQs off causes overhead, so you probably don't have it in your kernel. But let's say I want to turn off function, all the functions being tracing. <coughs> Excuse me. So there's an options directory. And inside options directory, uh, you it will modify how traces work, how uh, the trace output works, and a bunch of other things in options. There's documentation on uh, each of everything that uh, these options, how they affect the kernel in the documentation directory. So if you look in documentations, tracing, and there's ftrace, uh, RST file that you could read all about this. So in there, I put in you know echo zero to um, the function trace, which means tells the tracers don't enable. Um, function tracer if you enable one of the latency tracers. And I enabled the IRQs tracer. And here you get, this is a full snapshot of what it is. Um, of course, that latency is really big and that's um, because of a soft IRQ did something that took a long time. And I got to see where it happened. It gives you a stack dump at the end of the trace. So like I said, uh, there's tracers that create their own functionality. Uh, the HW lat tracer, which is a hardware latency tracer, it will actually create a, th when you enable it, it creates a thread that runs and it will um, basically hog a CPU for a certain amount of time and it will check for any uh, latencies that you might see when you run it. So in Microsoft, it'll show you, um, basically it's looking for SMIs or anything that the, the computer did uh, from the operating system. So it's just doing a, it's got interrupts disabled and it does a quick spin and makes sure that nothing happens. And if there's a gap in reading two timestamps, it'll say, ah, the hardware is doing something here. These are pretty big not times because I ran this on a virtual machine. So anytime that a, the host scheduled the guest out, that showed up as a hardware latency within the guest. Uh, right now we're working on another uh, tracer called OS Noise Tracer. Uh, Daniel Bristot's working on that where uh, it's going to do the same thing, but not just looking for hardware latencies, but basically do you, how soft IRQs, how to IRQs, NMIs, what does the system have to, happen to do? And also it'll preempt the process and say, hey, you know, you have other uh, uh, threads in the in the kernel that's going to preempt me from running. So it's that'll be coming up soon too. So there are traces are still being created uh, as we speak. Instances. So let's say you want to do more than one, run more than one tracer, or you want more than one buffer for various reasons. Um, you want to say, I want some events in one buffer, some events in another buffer, or let's say you want one tracer running in one buffer, like function tracing going on in one buffer, and a latency tracer going on in another buffer, or events going on in another buffer, or function graph tracer, or one of these other things going on. So say if you have one event that's you 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 want to trace, but happens rarely, and another trace that you uh, event that you want to see going on, but that event happens a lot, like an IRQ, a scheduling event that will overflow the buffer, and you'll lose the events you want to see. You could create multiple instances where you enable event uh, that you want to trace um, that rarely happens in one instance, and the busy um, uh, what's called the greedy one or whatever you want to call it 
uh, for event will be in the other uh, instance. And that way, if it overflows the buffer, it won't affect the rare one. And to do that is there's inside the tracing directory, there's an instances directory. And all you have to do to create a new instance is do a make dir. So here I did a make dir instances foo, where I created an instance called foo. And if I look inside there, you'll see um, a subset of the same functions that were at the uh, tracing directory. And it allows you to enable and disable uh, functions um, or events and tracers inside an instance that doesn't affect the top level instance or other instances. You can make as many as you want, considering you have memory to do so. So here I just, you know, in this case, I did um, from the top level, I enabled function tracer at the top level. I made, made uh, created a foo instance and I enabled the events and then I cat it. You'll see it has all the events, but it doesn't have the function tracing uh, intermingled. So Let's go back and talk about tracers versus events. Now, <clears throat> events, again, are static points within the kernel, and they give specific data that the developer wants. Tracers add functionality, changes things. Uh, if you create your own tracer, you, you could do whatever you want to it. So if you want to uh, implement some special code, like I said, latency tracing or whatever, um, that's what tracers are for. So they are distinct. But let me go and look at something else too with events. Dynamic events. They're same as normal events in what they look like, but you know, they're not created with the trace event macro. They're created at runtime. So the way they usually do it, they in, are injected within the code. Uh, they're similar to events that they extract specific data. Uh, K probes uses a breakpoint, but if you do it at uh, the start of a function, it may use F trace, which means there's doesn't have the overhead of a breakpoint. It, well, remember the F trace, what I said was a way of um, hooking into uh, the infrastructure that allows you to hook at every function. So if a, you attach a K probe to a function that's that uh, F trace can hook to, it will use that, which is much quicker than doing a breakpoint. There's also synthetic events, which allows you to connect uh, two events together to share, to create a third event that gives you information between those two events. Uh, the K-probe events you could find, like I said, you don't have to memorize everything I'm giving in this presentation. Everything is documented. Uh, we're trying to keep up with that, keep up with the documentation. So if you look in documentation, trace, K-probe trace, everything we talk about here is documented in there. The interface to create um, K-probes is in the K-probe events directory within the tracing, or sorry, great probe events file within the Tracing directory. Um, again, if you put if you attach it to the start of a function, it will use uh, F trace, which is fast. Uh, if you could also hook a K probe to the body of a function using the offset. So if you do an, basically a disassemble of a function from the kernel, going to GDB, do disassemble of schedule, and you'll see the offset of the schedule that you want to attach to. So you put in schedule plus some offset, it'll put a breakpoint in. And K-probes even has a way to optimize that if it will analyze that function and see if it's safe to actually replace that breakpoint or the, the code that's being breakpoint with actual jump. And it will then, so when the code hits it, it'll jump to a trampoline that will simulate what it just wrote over and then it still do your tracing. So it, that can actually be much faster than a breakpoint. So how do I, let's see, why would I want to use K-probes? and k-probe events. So inside the scheduling code, uh, code, you'll see this thing called activate task. And activate task means that a task wants to run. I want to activate it. It wants to wake up. So at the low level, it says, OK, this task is about to start. It's going to run. I want to put it on the run queue. Let's activate it. So let's say there's no trace point there that I can look at there. So there's no trace point in that code that I want to see some information and I see struct task struct P is in the activate task and I want information on that uh, task P. So let's look at task struct. So inside include Linux sched.h, there's a task struct and I see the process ID, the PID for it and the com, which is the, uh, the task name. But I, want to, I need to know the offsets of that pointer. So Here's a little trick for the offsets of the pointer. So if you go into GDB and you have uh, debug information enabled on your kernel build and you do GDB VM Linux, you can actually find the offsets of structures by this. And the trick is, is you basically typecast zero 
to the structure you want, to a pointer of the structure you want. So you'll see struct task struct star the zero, and I put a parentheses around that, and then I offset that PID, and then I say, okay, print the address of the PID field of task struct for the value of zero. And that gives me, now task struct's a very large structure, and you'll see that the task struct index is at, you know, hex 888. I want to do the same thing for com, and you'll see that it'll print you uh, index. So I quit out. I do a switch user to, um, I change to a root. I CD the tracing, and then I write this string in there. So uh, K probes, I said, this is described in that K probe trace RST file that's in the documentation directory. Um, so you echo P stands for probe, colon, the name of the event I want to give this. So let's, I'll call it activate. The function name that you want to hook to. Now, again, I could actually I don't have to put a function name. I can actually put the function name plus an offset. But since I'm going to use the arguments, I have to use the function name itself without an offset. So I put activate task as the function name I want to trace. I say PID um, from argument two, dollar sign arg two is the second argument. If I go back, just to, so I show you again here, you'll see this is argument one is RQ, argument two is P. So I use arg two. I index, I do a plus zero X um, AA8, which is just kind of like if you've done assembly code, it's similar to assembly code. So I take the value, I'm going to index off of it. I'm going to, I want the 32-bit value for that because I know PID is an int. And then I do the same thing for com and I do I do its offset with arg2 as well because they're both using the same, their task struct P is arg2 for both of them and string. And I cat that or I uh, redirect that output into um, K probe events. So when I enable this function, I see here's my activate task, the process ID that's being activated, and the name of the process that's actually being there. So I get to see all that. So next thing you want to look at is uh, synthetic events and histograms. This is described in documentation trace histogram that RST. So you don't have to remember everything I do here. Uh, the interface is three files that you'll need. Uh, there's a synthetic events within the top level tracing directory. And then within, when after you create a synthetic event or to create the synthetic event, uh, you need to attach, attach two, usually you have to attach two events together using the histogram and trigger fields. Actually the trigger fields is the only one mainly you did, but histogram also works too. I'll show, talk about that later too. So, yeah, it, um, it creates events uh, based off of two events. And for example, if you want to track latency, it has functionality for that. So if you look at this code, I added, I'm going to add two K probes. So I'm going to do, I'm going to create a K probe for activate. And I did the exact same thing using this, basically the same parameters. The deactivate task function is when a task is deactivated. So I want to see from the time that a task is deactivated to the time that a task is activated again. So I created two trace uh, trace events. If you notice here too, on the second line, instead of doing a, uh, whoops, instead of doing a, just a greater than, I did a greater than greater than, which is a concatenation to trace uh, K probes, because if I just did greater than, I would have deleted the activated event that I just created. So I create the activate uh, uh, event, and then I create the deactivate event by concatenating it to trace probe events. And then I echo, um, I create a histogram using keys. I'm going to, I want to trace the process ID. So I'm going to, uh, the way to do this, I have to figure out what, uh, what um, field can match the two events. Because you have to have a way to match, like if I, uh, the deactivate and activate, I want them to match by their process IDs. So here I'll say the process ID is my key. And common timestamp is a special keyword for this trigger that when you say what's going to do is going to record the timestamp of the event. So I create a variable called TS, map it to the time, common timestamp, which is a special value, it's kind of like a special field, which is the timestamp, and put .us, otherwise it's in nanoseconds. And nanoseconds is too much information. I just care about uh, microseconds. And I cat it to deactivate trigger. And when I do that, it gives me an error. So if you do wrote that, and the reason why I did this was I want to show that if you make an error, this is in recent kernels, by the way, all this talk is about the most recent kernels anyway, um, you can cat error log and it'll tell me there's an invalid field modifier and I can look at my documentation and look what I wrote and I said, oh, USEC, that's not what I want. 
it's plural, it's U6. So I have to put common timestamp that use it. So I put that in there just so you could see that if you make a mistake, look at the air log and it will remind you like, oh, I made a mistake. And now it works. So I do the same thing. Or So now what I do is actually I create a synthetic event called activate lap. And I pass in uh, a PID and lat. Well, the PID is just going to be a um, U32, which is basically an unsigned integer 32-bit and 64-bit uh, latency because timestamps are 64-bit. So I create a latency for 64-bit and a PID because I'm going to record the process ID and the latency. And I cut that into, or I echo that into synthetic events that creates an event for me. And now what I do is this is the most common or uh, exp um, complex thing, but described well in the documentation. I also have easier ways. We have user space tools that use SQL that will make this a lot easier. That's coming in the future. But for now, uh, if you echo histogram, which is the keyword, uh, keys PID, this is the PID of the uh, activate um, event, not the deactivate event. So this, these two have to match. If I had the activate, say, PID one or something like that, that would be PID one. This is how this, these two fields are what maps between the two events. They just happen to be the same name for both the events. But for like example, wake up and schedule, wake up is a PID, schedule would be probably next PID you would want to do for doing the same thing. Um, I create a new variable called lat, and I'm going to use the common timestamp of uh, the deactivate timestamp and minus dollar sign is means it's a variable TS, which will map to the first event that it matches. So when it matches the two, it will, if you have a variable defined in the first event, you could reference that variable in the second event with the dollar sign. So that's how I map that. So it takes the timestamp of the deactivation and subtracts it from the timestamp of the activation. And that gives me my latency that I want to trace. And here's a keyword on match. Uh, K probes is the, uh, the, that matches the system. Remember the groups that was so the all the K probes events unless you specify a group will go underneath the name K probes and deactivates so activates going match deactivate here and then I'm what I'm going to do when the two deactivate by the way I didn't have enough room on one the slide to do it so I just put in a quote slash start again here so this is actually attached to one uh, the the parenthesis and the dot are together just to point that out so I'm going to trace it when the two match I'm going to trace calling a this trace means call a synthetic event and it's going to trigger the activate lat and it'll pass in the pid and the latency dollar sign since now i'm using the variable name I, which matches here to this event and i pass that in all that for this so after i do that i echo a uh, synthetic event uh, because now i created a synthetic event it's a actual event underneath the synthetic group and you'll see activate lat, I hit echo one, enable it. You'll see the trace. And down here, you'll see uh, the activate and all the latencies of how long in, in microseconds of that latency. If I wanna make a histogram out of this, I would actually use the histogram uh, trigger as well to say hist colon uh, into the synthetic event activate this is actually the histogram like i said we did the uh, attachments but you can also it'll also do histograms as well you'll see that here i'm going to do the keys the pid and latency and i only want to record it if the latency is less than ten thousand. reason why is because there's a lot of latencies this things are deactivated for a long time so i only wanted to see things that are de um, deactivated for a short time so i had enough to um so i didn't overflow the what i could put on a slide but this also shows that you could filter uh by it, uh, histograms and everything takes filter allows you to filter um you can filter events kind of similar just read the documentation i'm not going to talk about it right now but there's a lot that the tracing functionality tracing infrastructure gives you i pass this into the trigger i cat this is the his file now it shows me the histogram of all the times uh gives me a nice little histogram i sorted it um whoops i didn't do a sort in here so you can sort this as a way to sort it so it comes out nicer than this but that's just give you an idea that it exists. I want you to go and read the documentation to find out how to do it properly for your own use case. Now, debugging the kernel. So let's say you want to debug the kernel and you're modifying um, your device driver and you're doing an interrupt that gets hit thousands of times a second. And if you put print K in there, uh, it just fills up the console and you can't debug anything because you live locked the machine because by the time the print K finished, the next event happened and you did a print K again, it just fills up your console, you can't get anywhere. So it's really hard to debug. Trace print K is something that was added so that you could 
trace within your kernel um, while you're debugging it, you could put print statements all over the place. You could put thousands of them. And it's so fast that you'll hardly even notice it in overhead. Um, it will record to the um, ring buffer, and then you could print it, or you could write it or read from the ring buffer. And you could even trigger it. So there's an F trace dumps on oops option that you could put in the kernel command line or in the proc file, sys file system, the sys control system, that if an oops happens, it'll dump the entire um, F trace ring buffer. So you can see all your print case there. Just be careful. Just make sure you, if you're going to use that, shrink the size of the ring buffer. There's a way to do that in the documentation. You can find it. Uh, otherwise, you might be waiting a few days for the output to finish on your console if you have a slow serial console. But anyway, trace print K works just like print K, but can be used anywhere. Um, you can use an interrupts, scheduler, NMIs. Um, it's, it's lockless. It's fast. And you don't know how much work we did to optimize this. If you look at trace print K, it's actually a macro that determines using compiler or you know GCC built-in tricks to say, like, say if you just put a string in and without any uh, parameters besides that, like you're not doing a trace print K percent S and putting something else in there, you're just putting a, a print, trace print K of a string, it'll actually convert it to a trace put S. Uh, so it's really optimized well. And in fact, it won't even do the uh, processing of this S printf processing fully. It uses a new thing called binary format processing where it just, it will record the format and all the options uh, that you pass to it, and then it will do the formatting after um, at the read side of things. So it really tries to be extremely, extremely fast. Um, no, it should not be left in production. Um, reason why is trace print K is a, it's like print K. It prints, it will always print. Um, you don't have the option of um, turning them on and off individually. You could turn them on, all on, or you could turn them all off. But trace print K, if I were to allow this to be something that could be used in production, everyone would do it. And that means that it would put so much noise in when you want to try tracing something, you'd have all the other trace print Ks inside all the everyone else's um, uh, drivers and everything. And you'll have so much noise that uh, you won't be able to say anything. If you if you find that you want this information, if you're doing trace print K and say, this information is important for me to have in production, make it into a, a trace event macro that could be enabled and disabled and will not uh, clog up the ring buffer from everyone else doing this. If you do leave it in, there's a trick in the compiler that says, ah, you used to trace print K and it will get this really nasty notice on your kernel console. Uh, some of you might have already seen this and you'll see this notice. It scares people. It was legitimately made to scare people. That's the only way I was able to make it so that trace print K will not be used in production. But in your debug code, if you see that notice, you're debugging it. Good. So remember that activate task that I put the K probe in? Well, let's say I had the ability to build the kernel. I was doing debugging. I want to see information there. I just, this is the equivalent to that K probe that I just did. I just put a trace print K at the beginning of the function. I said, okay, give me the PID, give me the com, and boom, I got the same information that I had with the K probe. So you don't have to do everything with the TraceFS file system. There's tools that are around it. So the main thing is TraceCMD, or I could pronounce it trace command. Uh, it's an interface to the TraceFS um, file. If you go to tracecommand.org, uh, it has full man pages of everything you could do. You can enable functions or you can enable tracing, enable tracers, enable individual events, enable uh, filtering, triggers, all this lovely stuff can all be done through the trace command macro. And it gives you man pages and it also has bash completion uh, help. So sometimes if you don't know what to type next, it, you just hit tab and it hopefully will uh, find something that, will, that you expect to use. Uh, on top of that is Kernel Shark. Uh, Kernel Shark is a GUI. We just released uh, Kernel Shark 2.0. I have to finish up and make the announcements better, but Kernel Shark 2.0, which allows a lot of plugins, allows you to visualize tracing between hosts and guests, latencies, and a bunch of other stuff. So this is a GUI interface to visualize all that trace information because you know sometimes text could just be too much. You can't really see what you're looking for because uh, there's too much data coming out at you. Live trace command was made um, is a library that basically is on top of trace command, and that's to do allow users um, other applications to be able to read and write uh, trace .dat files because trace command cre creates trace .dat files. Another thing that trace command does is it reads the raw ring buffer and records it directly into um, 
the uh, uh, file system using splice, which is pretty much a zero copy. So it's really fast. So you can record a lot more data that's than you have in the ring buffer size. And then trace command report will actually read that data and parse it. And that's what's uh, that file is used to uh, read for trace uh, for kernel shark and other things. So trace lib, uh, lib trace command is uh, weights that you could read that file too. And we're working on it. That's just started. It's got the bare minimum for uh, kernel shark to work, but we're going to be making it, expanding it. So all the functionality of trace command will be in this library in the future. Uh, something that this presentation wants to kind of focus on a little bit more is libtracefs, because libtracefs is the way to interact with that uh, with the tracefs directory without having to know all the files and everything else. It kind of makes it um, the process, the policy of saying I want to enable this tracer. So there's a way of enabling this tracer very easily without knowing that the file is current tracer. Uh, it does the work for you. So if you're uh, C code, uh, you want to write an application that interacts with tracing, uh, tracefs is for you. Lib trace event is used by perf and some other um, power top and stuff because it it has all the ways to read the format file remember that nasty format file and i said it's um things are converted the macros are converted to hard numbers and it's really hard to read uh lib trace event can read that and it will actually um, parse it and make it better for easy for you to um, get events from the raw data so one other little thing I want to talk about before we leave the whole TraceFS directory is one other file called TraceMarker. This is a way that user space can write into the ring buffer and inject something. So if you were to, um, let's see, if you start an application and open up this file as a file descriptor and just keep it open and throughout your application, you do a write to this file uh, descriptor and then close it at the end, it will actually inject at that time when you write it, the data. Reason why I say open it first and then at the beginning of the application because you don't want the overhead of the open to happen you just want the right uh it's rather fast too it's uh it's streamlined to do the bare minimum to write data and in, into the ring buffer and get right back out so it, we try you do have the system call to come in and come back out but other than that it's uh it's it's pretty fast um i think i i think we made it lockless too so it's pretty it's lockless as well perhaps um anyway would uh, open up the file description first and then later on do it um, the trace of lib trace s gives you helpers on how to using this so trace of s print init is that way of opening up in the beginning so like i said you want to open up the descriptor if you don't open it you just call trace of s printf it will see if it was opened or not if it wasn't opened yet it will actually uh, open it then uh, and with the overhead, but it'll keep it open. That's why you have to call TraceFS print close when you're finally done. Uh, it does allow you to pass the instance structure in there. So you can actually create your own instance and trace of, lib TraceFS gives you ability to create your own instance. So you get each application could have its own instance file that it's dealing with. So it doesn't have to worry about trace events happening from other instances or the top level tracing and TraceFS print in it will, and printf and all that will um, write to a specific instance. So give you an idea of how this works with instances and such. So if I go into the tracing directory and I echo uh, hello top level to the trace marker, and then I create a foo, and then I do echo hello foo to the instance foo trace marker, and I cat trace, you can see there's the uh, trace marker right inside um, down there. It says, you know, hello top level. And if I look at foo, you see my hello foo. Um, here's an example of how to use libtracefs. So I'm hoping that the libtracefs will be soon in all the distributions. And um, you may have to use package config to find out where it's located and installed because you have to include the dash L libtracefs uh, when you build your C file. But this simple trace print C file that I, uh, I have right here, this is the file in its entirety. Um, if you were to take this file, I have the slides um, uploaded. So hopefully you'll be able to get the slides uh, from the Linux Foundation. And if you were to take this, cut and paste it, record and compile it, like I said, you need to have libtracefs and libtracevent uh, installed. And you may have to pass in the dash L and dash I to find the pass for the tracefs uh, header and the library, and then execute it. You'll This will actually work. So let me just walk through really quickly what this is doing. Uh, first, first thing it does is it creates my own instance, and I called it my buffer. So see how easy it is? I just uh, create a struct, you know, TraceFS instance, name instance, and say, OK, call TraceFS, you know, or instance create, and it creates it. Done. Um, I do my init out. Now I'm doing this as an example because I'm 
going to write to the top level as well as write to my instance. Whenever you reference uh, in TraceFS, when you want to reference the top level, you always pass null as your instance. And then it just assumes that you this is the top level that you're going to write to. So the uh, TraceFS print init, null means initialize the trace marker for the top level. And then I do the init. So I go, OK, I opened up the uh, file descriptor for the instance director, uh, for the instance trace marker file. And then I do, you know, Trace of S printf null because I'm doing the top level, enable events. And then I enabled all the events within uh, my instance, the schedule, actually not every event. I did, it shows you how to enable a single event. So I enabled all sked events. So the trace of S event enable um, function takes an instance, uh, the sked group, or sorry, the event group, which is sked here. And um, null, I'm saying, if you pass null, it means enable all the events within this group. If I were to pass null null, that means enable all events. So null null would be all events. Um, a string would be the sched, or all events within a group. Um, if you do a screen, um, if I put sched and put sched switch in there, it just means enable just the sched switch event. I could put null sched switch if I forgot what group it is, and it will enable all the events that have that are named sched, sched switch in all groups. Currently, pretty much every event is unique um, unless you do your own probes. You can actually create a probe that has the same name as the event. If, uh, if you do that, and if you pass in that name of the event, it'll enable the probe plus the event, uh, the other event. So just to give you a note, understand what null in the group side means. And then I do my print into the instruments. I'm going to say, go to sleep. I sleep one, and then I say, OK, wake up. And then I disable all of the get events. And then I'm going to write disabled events to the top level. Um, I'm not going to destroy this because I want to be able to see the instance. But say if I wanted to do delete the uh, file, I would do um, TraceFS instance destroy of that. I did forget I do need a TraceFS instance free. I didn't add that in here. I just noticed I didn't have that. Um, but that should be go there. And TraceFS print close. Another bug in this code I just realized is this destroy needs to be after the reference of it. Because destroy means I just delete a directory, but having the close open, it may not delete. So this destroy should have been after there. Bug in my code, send me a patch, whatever. So if I were to now run this simple trace print, um, I did it. Trace command show actually shows you the um, is a way of doing a cat trace of the trace event directory. But if you notice here, I'm not in the tracing directory. Trace command will find the trace of S directory and it will do everything for you. And you can hear at the top level, you'll see that I have the enable events, uh, the, the writing done. And if I do the show dash capital B, which means I want to use instance, it stands for a buffer. So I say dash capital B, my buffer. And now it's going to do a cat of the trace of the instance, my buffer. Uh, or yeah, instances, my buffer trace file. And this is what you see. And you'll see all the uh, schedule events that were enabled, as well as my right to go to sleep and wake up. So with that, I think, I don't know how much time I had, but probably a little bit over, um, almost an hour, but that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, Steve, get... we have a couple of questions in the- Okay, I'll, uh... can I uh, turn off my uh, stop sharing? Is that okay? Okay, because that way I could see what's going on now. I think it's the same question uh, twice, but yes. Ah. Uh, what is the best strategy to trace RCU stalls? Um, this is um, actually in RCU stalls, usually what I do is I like to trace the sked events, interrupts, and stuff like that. And I believe in the RCU stall, sometimes we used to have a tracing off on warning. What I do is, what I should have actually mentioned in this talk is inside the kernel, like I said, you have the trace print K. You also have trace on, trace off. No one really uses trace on, but um, trace off, just put trace off, boom, it'll disable tracing of the top level file, of the top level instance. Um, and so if you're using trace print K, which also trace print K only writes to the top level instance anyway, as well. Uh, but if you do like put in trace print Ks or if you put enable events like schedule and stuff like that, and in the install RCU code, if you have a trace off there and there, I remember I tried to get something that we would put in a trace off, at least if trace off on warning, there's another thing to do is trace, F trace trace off on warning macro as well. That will, um, if a warning triggers, it'll, disable tracing and that's the tracing on file within the tracing directory so it will turn it from one to zero 
And that way, if if a um, uh, if an anomaly happens, like a warning happens, it will stop tracing. So that way, you have all the events up to the point of where the warning happened. And if it it turns it off so that you don't lose it because the ring buffer is only finite and it's a ring buffer, so it will delete the old stuff. So if you stop the tracing, you then you can look at all the events that happened up to then. I have had debug I I have debugged RCU stalls before, and usually, like I said. Uh, the process is you can enable all function tracing. Sometimes that works to see what functions are being called. Um, put in trace print case or just tra all the, enable every event. And when the RCU stall happens, tracing off right there, either inject it there. Uh, oh, uh, another thing you can do is if there's a function being called that could be traced within the RCU stall, because I think I've done this. The function tracer has a way to attach a probe to that will disable tracing if that function's hit. So if the RCU stall calls a function, you could actually, without modifying the kernel, say if you can't modify the kernel, you could actually inject a, a either, you could do it with a, a trace, you could do it with a trigger on a event. So you could either use the K probe or uh, use a function tracer does as well, has a way of saying when this function is hit, turn off tracing. So I have done that. I think I've attached that and said, turn off tracing if this function is hit, do it. When the stall happens, I have a bunch of data and then you have to go through and find out, okay, why did this stall? Hopefully that answered the question. There is another oh. question in the chat. Um, we can measure, I think it's a question. Yeah. We can measure latency between two events that don't have params that yeah. match this question mark. Yeah, I see. Is there a way to measure latency between two events that don't have a matching parameter? Um, well, here, I guess you could just, well, if it's not a CPU there, usually if you have two random events and you just want to see the latency between those two events, the question is, well, what about those events? We, I need to see a use case for it. Um, the question is, is there a use case for that? Uh, if not, um, then I'm not going to worry about it. If there is a use case, I'm sure that we could find something because you could match, like I said, well, either a process or say, if, there's usually something you want to attach something to, to see the latency between things. Um, maybe you can make up a, a variable and match the same variable name. I don't know. There might be something you could do. So I'd have to see the use case. I'm sure I could find a way of doing it. Um, any other questions or anything? Or did I just talk way over everyone's head? Andy, uh, you said there is another question in the question uh, and answer. The ah. two questions looked about the same. Would you like to turn on your microphone and ask the question? Looks like we have another question in the Q and A. Um, I think it's a use case. Oh, it. same one. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's a it's a use case for input from SPI treatment in user space to send result through Ethernet, um, and there's and there's nothing in there that would match what like I don't know like a packet ID, a pointer, or something that you could use to match the two events. Um, like say if you, I don't know, because um, okay, again. If it's totally unique, one thing you do if it's so, if it's that you, um, one thing you could do is I would say is if it's something so unique like that you don't need to use the static events. You could actually you if it's if it's going to be something like that I would just say enable both events, write your application and do the uh, latency from the libtracefs. By the way, somebody did mention that's coming out it was this thing called Trace Cruncher. I should have had a link to that. Um, uh, Jordan, someone on my team is. Uh, working on this and it basically adds it has a plugin to also add um libtracefs as a python module so you could write straight python and have all the access to libtracefs so you could write a python module that just says okay enable this event enable this event and also could read the buffer so you could okay now read the event and now for every event do something and then you'll be able to actually uh, do all your processing uh, within a python script A few more questions in the yeah. question. 
Dance. Um, says, other than IRQ's op preempt hardware latency, is it okay to have F-Trace enabled in production uh, config? I mean, F-Trace is enabled in most production configs. In fact, I basically require that uh, <laughs> for a lot of things. So th unless you want a lot, unless it's a, like a really like secure thing where you're paranoid that someone might, um, you don't want any way to break into it because um, F-Trace, you know, it's root only. If you're, if you can't trust root, so say if you disabled loading modules, loading all modification of the kernel, and you just want this to do something and not be modified in any way, then you might have F-Trace disabled. But other than that, um, F-Trace is not, doesn't really cause much overhead at all. It's like in the noise and all the trade in the tests that we've done, benchmarks we've done. Uh, but the, I think unless he's saying, is there anything that you, else you don't want to be enabled? IRQ is off, preempt, maybe hardware latency. Um, I'm actually work looking at ways to get those enabled. Hardware latency detector is something you could have enabled, but the question is, because actually I've seen it enabled in some productions, but if you run it, um, it will cause things. It will cause, it's only a problem if you enable that tracer. So it's up to you. Yeah, on my system, looks like all of them are enabled. Not, not our IRQ soft, but right. others. Yeah, the IRQ soft, I guess, because that one actually does have a measurable impact of like maybe 1%. Uh, when you have it enabled. So Allison, what's uh, any general advice about tracing with RT kernels beyond the observation with event tracing is less likely to disrupt the behavior we want to observe with enough granularity filters and function tracing to be useful. Um, by the way, Allison, you do understand that F-Trace came from the real-time work. Um, all this, most of the functionality, um, not in the same way, but was in the real-time kernel to debug and find latencies. And that's why everything's very, very focused on actually real-time workloads um, because that's actually where F-Trace came from. So yes, um, in fact, that's why we also try to make it really low overhead because we don't want that Heisen bug where you, know, you see a bug and then you enable tracing and then the bug goes away. Uh, that happens sometimes. So ideally there's a way of doing this. Like if you enable all functions to be traced, yes, that's going to cause overhead. So usually what we do is I'll just enable like locks, the function locks, you know, that's quite a bit, but it, the, F, the function trace is really fast per se. So it, a lot of times it works pretty good. And yeah, so you can, you start off slow. So basically if you enable everything and it causes latencies to go out of the water, then don't do it. In fact, actually uh, cyclic test is one of the mo more common utilities that's used to uh, analyze uh, how um, a system is real time actually has hooks to the you know TraceFS file system to enable tracing markers and enable stuff and uh, actually moved it to have trace command do all the work and then enable cyclic tests. Uh, but usually we tell people to, to um, do a minimum of things. Like I said, use the filters. Yes. So, I mean, I could probably have a whole talk on that. Let's see, did I lose here? There's a few more. Yep, um, I see. Uh, let's see. Hopefully it's say, can you speak briefly on the differences between F-Trace and other Linux performance tracing tools and why you choose to use one versus another and some other tools naturally more pseudoized, correct? Uh, particular debugging use cases versus others. Okay, so um, good question because there's other things. There's um, F-Trace, you have perf, um, BPF uh, tracing utilities and LTTNG. Um, and then there's S-Trace and system tap. Um, and honestly, I've actually, well, I don't really use system tap as much, but the, um, and I think LTTNG has its own way of doing things. I'm not going to really compare that. We're very similar, but we also have different objectives. Um, for debugging, um, F-Trace, I think, is probably the best because it's right there. It has no utilities that's on top. The TraceFS directory is probably what makes F trace unique that you could go into a busy box machine or a machine with only busy box on it. And, and uh, all the traces that have a lot of uh, are installing any other tool, but we do have a shell and we could use F trace. Uh, that's like the key for keeping F trace around. Um, and also, they also share a lot of functionality. The events um, are used by both perf and BPF and LTTNG, the 
tracing infra infrastructures used by everything too. So they share the same infrastructure. A lot of the infrastructure is shared. Uh, it's just the use cases are might be a little bit different. Uh, Perf I find is really great for profiling. I use it if I just want to profile something. I tend to use Perf. Um, I always say with F-Trace and BPF, like some people say, well, you could do this type of filtering with BPF. Why don't you just use BPF? And to me, I say it's F-Trace is like bash, BPF is like C. Uh, if you just want to come down and do something really quick and do something that's very common, you write a bash script. If you start getting more involved and more complex, you might switch from bash to a C code. I kind of feel the same way with what you're doing with um, tracing if it's something real quick, a lot of times F trace is just good enough. If you start doing more complex thing where you need uh, decisions made within the kernel, uh, you may need to switch over to start using BPF as well. But I'm also trying to make F trace and BPF work together as, as also. Uh, does perf use TraceFS underneath? Actually, some of it in some of it it does. When you do, uh, that's why lib lib trace event, which does the parsing. Um, read perf reads the trace event format files or yeah the, the format files within the trace directory so perf uses that it doesn't actually there is a f trace portion of perf that you can actually enable function tracing and stuff like that but it doesn't actually it has its own uh it uses a system call a perf system call to do most of enabling disabling of the functionality but um but for uh, tracefs it does use it and that's why the libraries are shared too Can perf be used to configure and use all the features of ftrace without getting the hands dirty with the ftrace directory directly? But I'm thinking trace at best directly. Um, like you said, there was some work with that. Trace command actually um, is a was an equivalent. They're kind of working together. I mean, I work with the perf folks too, and uh, uh, trace command is similar, but it focuses on ftrace only. So trace command is basically what we use uh, for not getting your hands dirty. I actually seldom go into the TraceFS directory today. I actually use trace command almost purely. And what would you advise for debugging early kernel startup, say after ftrace is uh, initiated? Well, there's inside the kernel, um, if you look into kernel parameters, F, there's a lot of ftrace. You can enable events, you can enable function tracing, you can enable filtering, and I plan on adding a bunch of more um, to that. Also, Masami Hiramatsu has in, uh, introduced boot config uh, that allows you to attach complex command line options to the init uh, RAM disk. So using, if you go, you'll see tools boot config uh, inside the source code. If you compile that, you can actually attach boot config, uh, a, uh, you create a file that, that's kind of like a JSON type file um, that says, okay, enable this function, enable this, and put in a lot of complex uh, features and then um, pass that or, run boot config to attach it to the init RD disk uh, when you boot, and then you add to the kernel command line, boot config to the kernel command line. And that will tell the kernel on boot up, hey, there's a, a boot config attached to the RAM disk, go read it. And then it will go read it. And then it allows you to it will enable all the functions. And we try to make ftrace start really, really early in boot up. It's not, doesn't, it's before the init calls are even done. So basically once memory has been initialized, ftrace is available uh, pretty much immediately after that, before other CPUs start and everything. So you could trace a lot at early boot up. Um, okay, so I think I answered that one, I hope. Um, any other questions or anything else? I do hope everything was useful. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much, Steve, for your time today. And thank you to all the participants who joined us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today, and a copy of the presentation slides will be added to the Linux Foundation's website. We hope you'll join us for future mentorship sessions. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.